It's 10 o'clock at my computer, so welcome everyone who's able to attend today and those of you who are attending in the future via the recording. That's one thing I want to mention is that all of our um, Encompass Lives are recorded, so whatever you say over the airwaves will be recorded for posterity, but don't let that scare you. If you have a question and you want to um, want me to unmute your microphone, just type in the questions uh, section. I have a microphone, please unmute me, and I will let Christian know that somebody wants to speak, and I'll unmute you so you can ask your question yourself. Otherwise, you can type your question into the question section, and I will be watching that and try to kindly interrupt Christian at a good time and mention, here's a question from one of the people who are listening today. Um, the Encompass Live is, is live every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And then, as I just said, we record them so you can always look at the archives of all the recordings to view something at a later date. Today, I am very happy to let you know that we have Christian Minter, the Community Engagement and Health Literacy Librarian of Magookan Library of Medicine at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Can you tell I read that off of the the blurb. <laughs> so um, I'm going to now make Christian a presenter and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, let me show my slides. All right. Um, can everyone see my, let's see, hold on one moment. All right, can you all see my slides? Robin, uh, can you see her slides? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you for having me. Um, I, I am a community engagement and health literacy librarian at UNMC. Um, and before my current role, I used to work for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, uh, promoting health information resources from the National Library of Medicine and other uh, trustworthy organizations. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, responding to diverse health information needs. Um, Nebraska has a small but growing um, multi-minority and multilingual uh, population. Um, and so by the end of this session, I want you to be able to explain the role of language and culture in health literacy. Uh, be able to identify changing trends in the cultures and languages represented in Nebraska and then be able to list at least three resources that you can use in your library to provide multilingual and multicultural health information. Um, I'm going to talk about more than three resources, but I hope that you lead to being able to remember at least three of them or identify at least three that are relevant to your community. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, my collaborator, uh, Annette Party, Party Moss. Uh, we worked on this presentation together and originally presented at the Nebraska Library Association Conference last year. Uh, so first, let's talk about health literacy as it relates to language and culture. Uh, I like the definition provided by the um, Affordable Care Act which defines health literacy as the degree to which an individual has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. So health literacy covers every aspect of how a patient or caregiver might use health information. Uh, it goes far beyond just the ability to read or write. Although this is important, uh, it includes a combination of reading, uh, listening, numeracy skills, decision-making, uh, communication, and the ability to apply all of that to a health situation. And so when we talk about obtaining, we want to make sure that people are able to easily get to the health information they need. They know where to find it. They know who to talk to to help them find it. And when they process it, they're using all those reading, math, and logic skills uh, to make sense of the information. Um, to, when they communicate, they're able to describe their health issue uh, and ask questions. So that could be the questions they're asking of their health provider. It could be questions that they're asking when they come to librarians with help for finding health information. Uh, and when they understand it, they know what all the health information means 
um, and when they're able to apply it to make appropriate health decisions. So using it in their everyday life to um, stay healthy or to feel better when they're not healthy. Um, and it's important to remember that health literacy skills are not static. So even if you have good health literacy today, if you're facing a new health crisis that you're not used to experiencing, uh, the stress of that situation can cause you to have low health literacy. Uh, so sometimes we try to think of people with lower um, education, um, lower socioeconomic status, and think of those people as low health literacy. Um, but anyone, you can be rich, you can be highly educated, and it's just a matter of how you're interacting with each new situation. Um, so just remember that when you're in, encountering um, patrons who are asking for health information, don't assume that they are that they high, have high health literacy just because they may look a certain way. And on the flip side, don't assume they have low health literacy just because how they look or how they talk. Um, so there's an approach called universal precautions, which is where health professionals or anyone providing information related to health is encouraged to treat everyone as if they will struggle with health information at some time in their life, because it's true. So you wanna make sure everyone has that easy access to information they can understand. Um, health literacy um, is used for so many different things as part of the health process or navigating the healthcare system. Uh, so it can uh, be for, you know, filling out patient forms, knowing when a parent should take their child to get their um, annual physical, uh, following a treatment plan. So once they receive a diagnosis, being able to follow through on the treatment that's been recommended, um, interpreting different handouts or brochures, um, figuring out how to take medication properly, uh, understanding screening guidelines or vaccine guidelines, um, knowing where to go for appropriate care, so how to find a doctor, how to ask for um, a second opinion if needed, and being able to participate in healthcare decision making. Uh, patients are now required, expected to be a partner in the healthcare. So it's not just a doctor or a nurse telling them what to do, um, they have a voice in the process. And so they need to be empowered uh, to make that decision for themselves. And there is a cost of low health literacy. Um, there's a cost, physical cost, and there's also a financial cost. Um, when there is low health literacy, it's very detrimental to the health of the individual. Um, over one third of adults in the US have been identified as having basic or below basic health literacy level. Um, and they tend to have poor health status um, because they are not, they're less likely to use preventive care. So they don't have their regular dental checkups and doctor checkups. Uh, and so because they're skipping the preventive care, they're more likely to enter the healthcare system through an emergency room or through a hospital visit where their healthcare systems are much more serious. Um, and that leads to higher healthcare costs just across the board because they're now the health hospitals and clinics are paying for, uh, or, or I should say insurance companies are now have to come up, you know, pay more versus those preventative uh, visits would, would not cost as much. Uh, and there's also, there are illnesses that can be prevented. For example, colon cancer um, is one of the leading causes of cancer death for both men and women, but it's highly treatable if they're caught early. Um, so it's been estimated that over 80% uh, of deaths related to colon cancer could have been prevented if you know, individuals had gone and gotten their recommended cancer screening much earlier. Um, so that's the type of things that we're trying to, as librarians, we have a role in helping to prevent by providing access to quality health information. Um, health literacy is influenced by language. Um, so limited English proficiency, or LEP, uh, is when a person does not speak English as their first language and has a limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English. So LEP uh, acts as a barrier to healthcare because the default language for healthcare in the United States is English. 
So for both oral and written information, it's first provided in English. And for those that do have translation services, um, then there are interpreters available and sometimes health information and it can be provided in other languages. Um, health literacy requires the ability to, as I said earlier, obtain, communicate, process, and understand information. So if a patient is isolated from health information, then it's harder for them to make those good decisions. Um, and in addition to limited English proficiency, there are other language issues that could include differences in dialects or accents. So there can be confusion in communication between uh, the family and the provider. If one or the other has a, an accent or a specific dialect of speaking that's different and they're not used to it, um, or their communication disorders related to the physical difficulty of speaking or hearing. Um, research has shown that Latinos and Asians make up the largest uh, LEP population in the United States at this time. Um, and Asian Americans for whom English is a second language are expected to have a greater presence in the healthcare system. Um, what's interesting is that most of the health literacy research that has been done has primarily focused on English and Spanish um, because there are so many Asian languages, uh, they're just, they have not been able to address it yet. So we have validated health literacy screening tools in the medical system for people who could speak English or speak Spanish, but we don't have any screening tools for health literacy that address other languages. Um, and also most of this health literacy research has focused on uh, people's ability to understand English health information um, so we need more research for other LEP populations besides Spanish and studies that are able to evaluate patients' ability to understand health information in their own language and not just when we've translated um, or their ability to understand in English language. Um, Culture also plays a part in how people respond to health information um, or how they navigate the healthcare system. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states that culture can be defined by a group, uh, by group membership, uh, such as racial, ethnic, linguistic, or geographical groups, um, or as a collection of beliefs, values, customs, ways of thinking, communicating, or behaving. Um, so culture contributes to how someone defines health, illness, or healing, how they respond to a health message, um, how they choose to use health care, um, whether or not they follow treatment, um, whether or not certain treatments align with their values or beliefs, um, how they understand language and images and icons. So there are a lot of icons that we use in health information, brochures and handouts that we may be used to in the American culture or using American English. But as someone coming from a different culture, uh, they those icons don't mean the same thing or they might not mean anything at all. Uh, and it also culture affects how people choose to describe the symptoms that they're experiencing and whether or not they trust or mistrust medical culture in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, we have a history of certain minority groups that have been discriminated against um, in healthcare, um, have been uh, treated poorly. And so even though some of those situations may not happen as much um, or happen anymore, the generational mistrust of the healthcare system continues. So that's something else to think about when providing health information or helping others navigate uh, the healthcare system Chris in the U.S. Yeah. Christian, this is Sally, and I just want to say that I am icon challenged. I really try to read icons, but they don't make a whole lot of sense to me a lot of the time. And so I appreciate the fact that you're mentioning that as it relates to culture as well, because that makes perfect sense. I just right. wanted to. And, yeah, and thank you for sharing. And I think we, you know, when we think of culture, sometimes here in the United States, we think of U.S. versus culture from another country. But Icons don't even mean the same thing for us, like you said, who live in the U.S. Um, and I think that's something we think about if we're creating new materials or partnering with other community or community organizations, creating information materials. Um, healthcare professionals are encouraged to really think about what is the meaning behind the images and icons they use and making sure that what they think it means, you know, means the same thing for the patients who will be reading it. That makes good sense, thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, so just briefly looking at health literacy as it relates to language and culture, what does that mean for us as librarians? Um, first, just remembering that effective communication is not just the words we say, but it also incorporates the literacy skills of our patrons, their preferred language, and the cultural diverse, the cultural diversity. So, what cultural, um, do, what cultural background do they come from, and how does that influence how they view health and healing? Um, never assume that a patron uses a Western or American context for information. Um, you know, that can be included as part of a, a reference interview, asking, you know, what their preference is or if they have any cultural preferences for the information that they are, they want to receive. Um, and then there's no one size fits all for multicultural health information. Even with languages, there are multiple dialects, uh, and that's something you want to check with if you're providing um, information in another language. You want to see if it matches the dialect that they speak. So even with Spanish or other languages, there can be differences depending on what part of the world they come from. Uh, and then just remember that cultural awareness is a lifelong pursuit. So definitely there's no reason to feel bad if you don't feel as comfortable um, interacting with other cultures or you don't feel like you know as much. Um, there is this, typically the phrase cultural competence is used when used when talking about um, increasing our knowledge or skill with interacting with other cultures. Um, I prefer the, the term cultural awareness or cultural sensitivity because sometimes I'm, I think when we use the term cultural competence, it's like a checklist where we think, okay, I know X, Y, Z about these other groups of people and I'm good, I've, I'm competent now. But it's something that continues as long as we live, as long as we work, and as long as we're interacting with our neighbors and, and our patrons, you're always learning something new and you can always grow um, and, and change. So definitely look at it more as a lifelong pursuit than uh, a goal to be achieved in a certain time frame. Um, are there any questions related to health literacy um, or health literacy and culture and language before I move on to the next uh, section of the presentation? This is Sally and I'm looking at the questions form and there are no questions there at this time. So I guess okay. we can go forward. Thanks. All right, so next we'll talk about population trends in Nebraska. Um, and I know there may be some of you who may be listening from outside of Nebraska. Um, and at the end of the section, I will touch on some resources that you may be able to use to find similar data for your state. Uh, so the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services uh, puts out a health disparities report. Um, the last report that we were able to find for 2015, I'm not sure how often they update it. Um, but in that report, they showed that uh, the minority population was the fastest growing population in Nebraska. Um, it had been increasing more rapidly than, than white populations. Um, between 2000 and 2010, uh, the total population in Nebraska increased uh, by about 6.7%. Um, and racial and ethnic minority populations grew by 50.7%. Um, and on the chart, uh, you can see in blue uh, the population size uh, within each group uh, in 2000, and then orange shows that increase uh, in 2010. And uh, specifically, the Hispanic or Latino population grew the most uh, in that 10 year time frame uh, with a 77.3% increase, uh, followed by Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. Uh, and the Asian population increased uh, by 47% and followed by American Indian at 23%. And this data comes from, as I said, Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, as well as uh, the Census Bureau. This is a chart uh, looking at 2014 uh, data. So about four years ago, um, looking at the breakdown of minority population. Um, and we see that uh, 
among minorities, uh, Hispanic or Latino, who are leading uh, at 10% of the population, um, and followed by um, African American at 4.6%, um, and Asian at 2.1%, American Indian 0.8%, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander 0.1%. Uh, uh, sorry, hold on one moment, my phone is ringing. I apologize for that. Um, so Nebraska's population, so the previous chart was looking at that 10 year uh, increase and then going you know, a few years beyond that, uh, Nebraska's population had slightly more minorities uh, than it did in 2010. Um, so it's estimated that at that time, Hispanics accounted for about 10%. Um, and I looked, uh, they they don't update these charts, you know, as often as usually like maybe every five years, every 10 years or so. So there hasn't been a more updated chart yet uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but I did look at uh, the quick facts of the Census Bureau and it's about the same. There's a little bit of an increase. I think Hispanics are now about 11% of the state population. Uh, there's been a slight increase uh, within each group, but it's it's pretty close to what the chart put out uh, in 2014. Uh, this is a breakdown of minority population by county. Uh, so this chart was based on 2010 census data. Um, and you can see the darker the color of the county, the higher the percentage of uh, minority uh, living in that, that county. Um, so at that time, uh, the minority majority county, uh, Thurston uh, was the only minority majority uh, county, um, and it's possibly by now Colfax, Dawson, and Dakota may also uh, be pretty close as well. Um, most of this population is Hispanic or Latino, um, and Lancaster County. Um, I'm sorry, Douglas County, uh, racial and ethnic minority population, the largest percentage was Hispanic or Latino, and Lancaster County saw the next largest Hispanic population. Um, other counties have smaller Hispanic populations overall, but compared to their total minority population, uh, the Hispanic population is quite large. So this is just a good breakdown just to see the changes that are happening across across the state um, and which counties may have a higher need for uh, multicultural health information. Uh, so this chart uh, pulls data from Department of Health and Human Services and also the American Immigration Council. Um, and it looks at uh, the number of foreign born or immigrant uh, population in Nebraska. Um, and there was, a so the chart originally was looking at uh, the span between 1990 to 2010. Um, and I found some additional data from 2015 that I've, I added to the chart as well. Uh, so as of 2015, uh, about 7% of Nebraska population are immigrants. Uh, they're born outside the United States. Uh, the top countries of origin are uh, Mexico, India, China, Guatemala, and El Salvador as of 2015. Uh, and more than two thirds of immigrants uh, reported speaking English well or very well. Um, and according to Pew Research Center, um, as of 2016, Nebraska led the country in number of refugees resettled per capita. So we looked at the total number of uh, refugees who were resettled here and compared to the number of people in that area, we were leading to leading the country in that um, resettlement effort. Uh, so you can see that there's been a big jump uh, compared to 1990. We had a little over 28,000, and that has continued to increase. Um, so, you know, over 74,000 in 2000, um, over 112,000 in 2010. And as of the last data I could find in 2015, um, we had a little over 128,000 and continues to grow. So 
So there are, I was able to find a list from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid of the top 15 non-English languages spoken in Nebraska. And I am curious to see how many you can list. So you can go to the chat box and, um, you know, even if you can't think of the what, you know, the total 15, maybe see if you can think of at least five that you think, five languages that you think would be in that top 15 and go ahead and type them in. I have my eye on both the chat box and the questions. Okay, here comes one answer, Mandarin. Okay. I'm keeping my thoughts to myself for right now. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a moment but to see, if, <laughs> see what responses we give, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll show the next slide. Oh, we have the list. Another answer is Chinese. Okay. Yep, that's on there. All right. Any other guesses before I? Move on. Oh, here's some more. Oh, yeah, they're coming great like fast now. Oh, good. <laughs> There's one person who said Karen or Karen, Farsi, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Okay. Another person answered Spanish, Sudanese, Vietnamese, Karen, K A R K A R I N, Chinese. And then we have a person who said Farsi, and another answer is Hindi. And now Japanese popped up. Okay. So that's some good good yeah. possibilities. Good answers. All right. So here, according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, they put out this list in 2017. This is their list of the top 15 non-English languages in Nebraska. Um, so you see we have a Spanish. No, no surprise is that we have the most people in the state who speak Spanish. Uh, but we also have Vietnamese, Chinese, Arabic, Karen, French, Kushite, uh, German, Korean, Nepali, Russian, Laotian, Kurdish, Persian, and Japanese. Um, and there were some other, good, I think Farsi, Hindi, uh, some other um, options there that were listed. Uh, but these were the top 15 that you see listed on the screen uh, that we had the most people speaking this language. Thank you all. All right, so looking back uh, at, we spoke a few moments ago about limited English proficiency. So these are people who speak English as their second language, uh, but they may not be able to read, write, or understand it very well. Um, and so this is a breakdown of counties in Nebraska that have the highest uh, limited English proficiency population. Um, so you see in bold, the top five, um, Colfax County, Dakota County, Dawson County, Hall County, and Saline County um, have the highest percentage, uh, the, have the total county, I'm sorry, uh, the highest percentage of the population um, who's, who have been identified as low limited English proficiency. Um, so this is additionally good information. So it's good to know what languages are being spoken in your community so you know what type of health information to provide uh, in other languages besides English. But it's also good to know, you know, those who, who may have some English skills, to know what percentage of your community also maybe need some help in the English uh, information that they do receive. So maybe there may be certain languages, um, and when we touch on health information resources in a, a little bit, not all languages are covered by all these resources. So there may be opportunities where you still have to provide something in English. Um, and for that, you'll want to look for what's called easy to read resources, which are maybe resources written more in the third to eighth grade level that are much, the, English, the terms are much simpler and it's much easier for someone who's as not as uh, comfortable with English to, to read it and understand it. So for those of you who, uh, live outside Nebraska, um, or if you want to find more information, you're in Nebraska, but you want to find more local information, um, you can check with your school districts. They usually keep track of um, what languages are being spoken by the students um, in the district. 
Um, you can check with state and local public health departments. Um, community health needs assessments. Uh, most hospitals uh, in the different counties have to create a community health needs assessment like every five to 10 years. Um, and they usually include information on the languages that are being spoken in their community. Uh, and then the United States Census Bureau uh, also you can get information from uh, the census and the American Community Survey. Now, any questions about population trends? Okay, so next we're gonna look at some specific uh, information resources. Um, and I wanted to highlight this poster, um, Libraries Transform Campaign has some really great posters that you can use um, in social media and put up in your library. But I like this one because quality information helps you make better health decisions. And it kind of gets right to the point of why it's important that we provide information in a way that fits the needs of our patrons. Uh, when they have information, then they are informed and can make good decisions. So the first resource I want to talk about, which most of you may have uh, may be familiar with already, uh, Medline Plus. Uh, Medline Plus is provided by the National Library of Medicine. Uh, I like to call this uh, the medical Google. Uh, it has over a thousand different health topics and also information on drugs and supplements, uh, lab tests, different videos and tools for people to learn more about their health, um, medical encyclopedia to look up terms you're not familiar with. And um, they also provide links to trusted organizations. So federal agencies, nonprofits, educational organ organizations, and there are staff that actually select, uh, you know, they evaluate and select each resource that is added to this website. Uh, the website comes in both English and Spanish. Uh, so you'll see at the top right hand, uh, there's a link for Espanol. You click on that and then the whole site shifts to Spanish. Um, and in addition to the other resources within the website, uh, Medline Plus also has um, a magazine. Uh, so they have one in English um, and they also have one in Spanish. And so your library can um, subscribe. Uh, anyone can go to the website and read it online for free, um, but you can also uh, subscribe to have a bulk subscription uh, sent to your library. So if you want, you know, 25, 50 copies, um, you can sign up for that as well. All right, so down at the bottom, um, there's a link, as I mentioned earlier, easy to read materials. These are resources that are specifically written in a third to eighth grade level. Um, everything on Medline Plus is you know, much easier to read than what you would find like in a medical journal. Um, but the easy to read resources or materials are written specifically geared towards an even lower reading level as well. Um, so not every health topic is covered under easy to read, um, but once you click on easy to read, you'll be able to see what topics they have covered. Um, and then also there's a link for health information in multiple languages um, that gives you a list of Every, you know, every topic that's covered in a language other than English on Medline Plus. So here's a look at the easy to read uh, page. And it has uh, information for those who are writing materials. So if you're creating a brand new um, handout or brochure, they have some guidelines to help you. So this is something that you can use within the library or you can share with a community partner. Uh, that's creating materials that you want to use. Uh, and then there's an A to Z list of all the different health topics that are covered um, at that uh, fifth to eighth grade reading level. Um, and then you'll also see that they include a link to Spanish. So any, and it looks like most of the resources uh, also have a Spanish version. Uh, this is the health information in multiple languages. Uh, so when you go to the page, a default list is showing you a link of the different languages that are covered. And if you want to browse by health topic, uh, you will click on that link at the top. And then it'll take you to an A to Z list of uh, the health topics as well. And then once you click on the topic, you'll be able to see which languages uh, cover that topic.
So the next resource I want to talk about is called HealthReach. This one is also created by the National Library of Medicine, and it's specifically created to provide information in multiple languages. So it has patient materials, uh, information for providers, um, and the patient materials uh, are to help with finding culturally relevant information in multiple languages um, and multiple formats. So they have print, video, audio, um, and you can also search um, by a specific health condition, or you can search by a particular language or format. Uh, for providers, the goal is to provide information for them to learn about different cultures. Uh, so they have information that provides cultural background, um, information on different types of clinical tools, or uh, information about a specific immigrant or refugee population. Um, the, it's a collection of kind of cross-cultural health resources that helps healthcare providers or health uh, educators uh, that are working with uh, different groups, uh, different multicultural groups. So for provider information, you can search by a specific country or a certain population, um, or you can search by a format, whether you're looking for print or audio or video, um, or browse by keyword. And what I like about uh, HealthReach is that they give you some information about um, not only the type of information, uh, but whether or not the resource has been reviewed by a medical professional, um, what, which languages are covered and the dialects, and then also what method of translation. Uh, so some of them are translated by company and some are translated by a community group. And so if that matters to you, you'll be able to see that data about the resource before you decide whether or not uh, to give it out to your patrons. Um, anything included in HealthReach has been um, reviewed for quality and accuracy. Um, and it's also, they take a look at uh, the trans quality of the translation as well. Um, and they include a date for the most recent medical review. They do encourage others to um, contribute. Uh, so a lot of this is not information that me that National Library of Medicine is creating themselves, but they're kind of curating quality resources that have been developed by other groups. Uh, and this is an example. This is a look at the A to Z index page. Uh, that you can search, like I said, by by A to Z, browse by A to Z. Um, and they also have special collections. So you'll see they have a collection of uh, refugee health information, um, weather emergencies women's health and family planning. And so these are topics where they have a um, more robust collection of information. Uh, and so they like to highlight those special collections within the website. Um, this resource is provided by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, it's an information portal uh, for health information resources and other languages. So it pri the priority focuses on resources that have been developed by um, the national, other national institutes. Uh, so they focus on mostly federal uh, agencies um, and they select the languages uh, for each condition uh, based on their research. So they'll, they've identified certain health conditions that have higher health disparities among minority groups. And so those are the health conditions that they focus on uh, on this website. Um, and then based on um, which populations tend to have um, higher disparities, then they'll select the, the languages that, that um, relate to those populations. Um, the goal of the website is to help uh, provide health information that's relevant uh, to populations experiencing health disparity um, and making those resources available to other in languages other than English. Um, they do link to, so their portal in and of itself, they focus on oops, uh, these nine health conditions um, and the languages they provide uh, include Spanish, Hindi, Korean, Chinese, Tagalog, uh, Vietnamese and Japanese. Um, and like I said before, they selected these 
uh, specific diseases because they have identified major health disparities um, in non-English speaking populations. Um, and they want to select uh, specific languages that, that align with those disparities. So you will find, so some of these uh, topics cover all the languages I have listed and some only um, cover some of the languages. But what I like about this resource is that on each uh, topic page, they include uh, a couple of paragraphs explaining the research about the health disparities and, and why um, they're targeting certain populations or certain languages. Um, and they also link to, so they link to Medline Plus on this website. Um, and then they also link to other federal agencies that have uh, multilingual resources. Um, Ethnomed is uh, managed by the Harborview Medical Center, which is in Seattle, Washington. Uh, this website contains medical and cultural information um, on immigrant and refugee groups. It's specific to, or I should say, it's geared towards groups that are, um, uh, that have higher population in the Seattle area. Uh, but most of the information is still relevant to other parts of the country. Uh, and the goal of this project is to make information about culture, uh, language, and health uh, easily accessible to healthcare providers. Uh, so more of the information is geared towards providers, but it's a good resource for librarians, health educators, anyone in the community who is working with multicultural groups um, and to learn more about the background um, and different health conditions that are common. Um, but they also have a section on patient education with a uh, selection of handouts uh, in multiple languages as well. A spiral is the selected patient information resources in Asian languages. And this is created uh, as a joint project between the South Cove Community Health Center and Tufts University Hirsch Health Sciences Library. Um, and the goal is to increase access to Asian language health information for both patients as well as healthcare providers. Uh, so they have uh, documents, uh, print documents uh, that are in multiple Asian languages. Um, they also provide some brochures and flyers. So if you want to promote this resource to the community or to healthcare providers in your community, um, you can print out their brochures and flyers and share them uh, with others. Uh, the Tufts University uh, continues to maintain this resource um, and they're funded by the National Network of Libraries and Medicine. So the American Indian and Alaska Native Health Portal is created by the National Library of Medicine. Um, and the goal of this resource is to share information about health and well being, specifically about Native American and Alaska Native uh, community. So, all the information is free. Uh, they focus, they have a section on health and wellness, which talks about health and wellness in the context of uh, Native American and Alaska Native culture and tradition. Um, it focuses on health conditions that are specific. Um, I should say health conditions where there are higher disparities within uh, Native American and Alaska Native community. Uh, the People and Traditions uh, talks about, um, it shares the some stories, personal stories uh, about health and healing. Um, and then Programs and Services uh, provides uh, links to relevant uh, services to that can you know, to support Native American health uh, and research and data. Uh, provides some uh, data, some of the current uh, data and research uh, about Native American health. So that serves both as a purpose to uh, help help educate the community about their own health, but also help support those who are working with Native American uh, communities or are doing research on Native American health. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, creates resources uh, on a lot of different health topics, uh, but here I've highlighted some of their resources that are uh, focused on multicultural communities. Uh, so these are not necessarily multilingual, 
Um, I think most of them are in English and maybe some in Spanish. Uh, but what I like is that they've created resources that are modified for African American, Native American, Asian American, and Latino communities. So they have uh, modified the information. They're talking about the same health topics, so diabetes, high blood pressure, um, smoking or tobacco related health conditions. Uh, but they have created a variety of different uh, handouts or brochures that uh, meet the, the needs of each community. Uh, so they reflect it in the photos and the, you know, in how they um, have created the handout. And so they want to make sure that it meets the cultural um, needs of, of each community group. Uh, and then this last resource I want to highlight um, is from the National Library of Medicine. Uh, the National Library of Medicine Specialized Information Services Division, which creates a lot of resources for community outreach. Um, they have created a very comprehensive list of resources uh, covering 12 different categories related to multicultural health information. So you can find anything from health literacy to law and policy to data to uh, interpreting and translating information. Um, so this is definitely a go-to website uh, with a list of links and relevant resources. Uh, you know, from it, you know, if you want to learn about cultural competency, competency uh, or funding opportunities, um, you know, this provides a very comprehensive list of resources. Um, so some of the previous websites I highlighted may be included on the list, uh, but it also adds a lot more. So I would say this is more uh, a list for librarians or for those who are working in the community uh, than for uh, the patrons themselves. Any questions about the health information websites before I move on? I don't see any questions yet. I'll let you know if they pop up, but I just want to say that is quite a comprehensive list of sources for people to to go to and and I'd heard of Medline Plus so I was feeling pretty good but the rest of them are are all new to me so thank you very much you're welcome and you know that's kind of like the tip of that there are others so what I you know what I like about Medline Plus and some of the other websites is they link to other agencies and organizations so you can continue to explore and find even more uh, that may be relevant for your community Good point. Um, and I, then the last, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I don't see any questions on the questions tab. Okay. So. Um, and then the last thing I want to touch on today is partners and programs. Um, so public, you know, all libraries, I feel like all libraries have a role in health information and providing health information to the community. Um, but we didn't, shouldn't have to feel like we do this by ourselves. And I know some of you come from smaller libraries where you don't have as many staff for programming um, or, or community outreach. So I just wanted to highlight some resources you can use and some ideas for potential partners to help um, increase the, the, your reach or your impact on the community. Uh, so the first resource I wanted to highlight is called Increasing Relevance, Relationships, and Results. Principles and Practices for Effective Multicultural Communication. Uh, and this uh, handbook was created by the Metropolitan Group in collaboration with the American Library Association. Uh, it goes over eight principles for effective multicultural communication. Uh, and they modified, so they created a handbook on multicultural communication, but then they modified it and created an addition specific for libraries. Uh, and explains how explains the different principles, and they provide case studies uh, examples from libraries or environments that are related to libraries. Uh, so I really think this is a great resource uh, to read through when you're thinking about how to do community re uh, outreach, especially when you're uh, interacting with cultures that may be different from your own. Um, and I'm not going to touch on all these different pr principles, uh, but it starts with just uh, checking your assumptions at the door. So before you begin working with any group, identify, you know, what are your preconceived ideas about that group and um, what stereotypes do you have and kind of look at 
the work that others are doing and getting feedback from the communities or those who are familiar with the community um, before you start working. Um, and then it just, you know, the, all the other principles build on that, you know, understanding the, the context, um, being invested, so not just um, going in there and doing something and leaving, but just making sure you're continuing to build those relationships that you have um, and how to um, create change as well. Um, this is a recorded uh, webinar uh, on the Web Junction website. Uh, so it was originally recorded in January 2016, uh, but the recording and the materials are still available. Um, and in this webinar, staff from the Seattle Public Library uh, explore how to provide inclusive outreach uh, to engage members of your local community. So how to identify the needs, how to uh, effective approaches for community engagement, and how to develop an action plan for cultivating partnerships. Uh, so definitely a good resource to check out. Uh, so for those of you who are already doing community outreach, who are your current partners? Or what are some ideas that you have for potential community partners? These could be any type of organization, agency, individuals uh, that you think would be a good partner to work with in uh, providing multicultural or multilingual health information. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and uh, type some ideas into the chat box. And then I have my own list on the next slide that I will show in just a moment. I'm just waiting to see what might come up. We have a question that relates to the resources that I'll ask you later at the okay. end of the thing. but. I'm waiting for, oh, here we go. Asian and Mexican American cultures, cultural centers. Okay. Is a reply good. to community partners. That's a good answer. All right. Anyone else? Not yet. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a good one. Um, here are some of my uh, ideas. Um, so the Community Action of Nebraska, there's a Nebraska Minority Resource Center in western side of the state. I believe it's near, closer to Shadron area. Uh, the Heartland Alliance Refugee Health Programs, um, your local public health districts and departments. Um, Area health education centers. There are several of those throughout the state. Uh, tribal health off officials and services, such as the Indian Center, Incorporated, um, community health centers, community and senior centers. Um, here in Omaha, we have community care councils, and there may be similar types of groups in other cities around the state. Uh, public schools, faith based groups, ESOL programs. Uh, so anyone who is doing any type of outreach uh, to multicultural groups are a potential partner. Um, oh yes, I'm looking at, sorry, look at my notes. The Nebraska Minority Resource Center is in Gordon, Nebraska. Uh, and the Community Action of Nebraska has local regional agencies. So for example, there's a Community Action Partnership of Western Nebraska, uh, and they also have some in other parts of other state. We have um, a question, in, oh, sorry. Yes. We have a question about ESOL. What does that yes. stand for? Um, some of us English, don't know. Yes. It used to be English as a second language, but they changed it. English. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. I'm sorry. I forgot to put that in my notes. But it's the programs that work with uh, people who are who English is not their first language. And so they're learning how to speak English. Um, but they changed the name of what it used to be, and I can't remember what the O stands for. <laughs> so I apologize, but those are the, the programs in your community that are teaching others who don't speak English how to speak English. Uh, so that could be a good way. You could either you know, host those programs, and, and some of you, I'm sure, are already hosting those type of programs in your library, um, or that could be a potential uh, partnership where you can um, use health information as a way to. Um, implement that in the process of them learning how to, how to speak or read English. Um, any other questions? All 
All right, so programming ideas. I had a few uh, that I wanted to highlight. Um, March is National Nutrition Month, uh, and that's a great way to highlight foods from different cultures or different parts of the world. Uh, so you can feature a healthy foods from the cultures represented within your community. So this can be a cooking demonstration, meal planning, snack prep, because um, nutrition is very a very important issue. Um, but one one way to make it culturally relevant is to um, highlight the healthy foods from within the cultures that you know, they're already familiar with. Um, so there's a link on the slide for um, heart healthy cookbooks uh, from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. Um, they have healthy recipes from African-American, Asian-American, Native American and Latino cultures. Um, if you have other cultures represented in, in your community, uh, then you can uh, you know, collaborate with with others who are more familiar with the culture um, and and uh, develop some programming to highlight how to eat healthy using foods that they're they're used to. Um, it's you know it's sometimes there's a struggle with um, emphasizing American foods uh, as the healthy way to eat, whereas there's a lot of healthy foods within different cultures and healthy ways of preparing foods. They're not just um, what we're familiar with here in the United States. Um, and also there's the fact that food has cultural significance. Uh, there's, you know, it's not just about eating to live, but there's just, there are a lot of cultural norms and cultural traditions surrounding food. And so that's another way to, to get to know uh, the different cultures and, and traditions of, of other, other people groups. Uh, multilingual story times is another option. Uh, this provides opportunities for families to hear their language spoken in a public community event. Um, children who learn more than one language uh, show an enhanced brain development and uh, enhanced communication skills. Um, and you can incorporate health information through stories and songs. Uh, the links that I have uh, listed on the slide uh, list uh, articles uh, that provide some guidance on how to provide a bio lingual story time. So even if, you know, English is your only language and you're not fluent in another language, there's still ways for you to incorporate um, other languages in your story time. Uh, and so uh, the first one, uh, Beyond Bilingual, is an article about um, making story time inviting uh, to all those who are learning English. Um, and then uh, the, the third one, bilingual story time, reaching through the language barrier, um, provides some guidance on um, how to create story times, uh, even if you're not as fluent uh, in other languages. And there are also opportunities for community events and activities. Um, so all of our communities have health fairs, blood drives, health screenings. Um, you may have uh, Native American powwows different uh, street and cultural festivals, town celebrations, your state fair, county fair. Um, these are opportunities for you to get a table or a booth um, and share information, information about what your library is doing uh, related to health information or you know, share specific uh, health information resources. Um, and if you don't have something, uh, this may be an opportunity for you to partner with other local groups and start something brand new. So if you have any other ideas for additional activities, maybe something you've already done in the past and you want others to know about, um, or an idea you've been thinking about, but you haven't had yet, yet been able to put it into action, feel free to share that. Um, in the chat box. Um, and then if you have any other questions, um, these are links to data sources um, where we found information about population trends. This is my contact information and I'm happy to take any other questions that you have. One of the questions that we had from the resources section is um, if we search for these resources in Google, will they come up? If like I, I jotted down a few of the names because I thought you were going to ask what are some of the resources and I was going to be a real smart ass. <laughs> I have a whole list here. But like if I if I search for ethnomed in yes. Google, that pop yes. up right away. It will come up. 
Yes, and I can um, make my slides available um, if if uh, Nebraska Library Commission wants to post them on the Encompass Live site, and I'll make sure that the URLs for all the resources are in there. That would be terrific because we love to have the slides with the, um, the we, we recorded the presentation, so the slides are in the presentation, but um, having the slides separately would be great too, so people could just zoom to the one they wanted. And, right, and right. On a link. Yeah. Yeah, but yes, if you, you know, if, if you want to start looking at them before the slides are posted, if you do a Google search, you should be able to find them. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, uh, a person says, I would love access to the slides. So um, we'll get them up on our web page so that you can click on them because She's from Texas, I believe, when I was looking at her name. Okay. Um, Texas State Library. So, yeah. Yay. We have mostly in-state attendees today, but a couple of people from other places. So that's always exciting. And if we don't have any other questions, um, I'd like to thank you, Christian, for attending and presenting such a vast amount of information to us this morning. That was wonderful. And I know I'm going to have questions later, so I can find out what your email is <laughs> if I come up with some. Um, yes, yeah, definitely. I'm, you know, anyone that have any questions, um, my email will be on the slides as well. Oh, and you're happy to, to reach out. Um, and I'm, you know, if anyone has any, wants to bounce ideas off of community, you know, different types of community outreach or just needs guidance on um, how to find um, health information. Um, I do want, I forgot to put this in the slides, um, but here at University of Nebraska Medical Center, we have a service called uh, the Community, I'm sorry, Consumer Health Information Resource Service or CHEERS. Um, that we've been operating for over 30 years where anyone in the state of Nebraska uh, can send us their health information questions. Um, so it can be, you know, someone from the public or a librarian asking on behalf of someone. So if, if you receive a question related to health information that you feel like it's not something you're able to respond to, we're here to be a resource for you as well. And that can include guidance with finding um, multilingual information. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who attended today and those who are going to view this in the future. I know you got a lot of good information. Thank you again, Christian, and appreciate your time. Thank you.